So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, uh, special lecture 2015. Uh, my name is uh, Masahiko Hara. I'm in charge of the um, uh, TKT uh, Campus Asia program here in Tokyo Tech. TKT for Tokyo Tech, Tsinghua, and uh, KAIST, TKT. And uh, also, I'm in charge of the, uh, the summer school here in Tokyo Tech 2015 uh, here. OK, so uh, this uh, special lecture is um, uh, we say um, uh, part of the, uh, the lecture series called uh, Advanced Technology in uh, what's Emerging Fields, <laughs> Emerging Fields, <laughs> and which is uh, compulsory for the uh, uh, Campus Asia, the students. Uh, but every year we open the, uh, this uh, special lecture to the public, especially for the uh, uh, Tokyo Tech students and uh, administrative and uh, also the uh, faculty members here. So today um, we have a special lecturer, uh, Patrick Hara-san. Patrick. <laughs> yes. And then, then, then of course, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, the lecturer in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo Tech. So, uh, so now I hand to the, uh, this mic to you. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor Hara. Hara-san Yoikina, actually. Let's give him a <laughs> round of applause. Well done. OK. So, uh, for those of you who know me, I am uh, Patrick Harlan. I'm a comedian and uh, entertainer. I go by the name of Paku Makum here in Japan. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, basically the Tom Cruise of Japan. Uh, but I also teach here at Tokyo Tech, and I'm very excited to be here uh, with all of you speaking about a very important subject, technology of tomorrow. You young people are growing up in a crazy world. It's got a lot of problems. We've got war and famine and drought and global warming and a growing wealth gap and pollution and broken governmental systems around the world, international conflict, overpopulation. You guys have it tough. And the reason that the world is such a mess is because everybody older than you screwed it up, like me. So on behalf of my generation and all of the older people around the world, sorry, sorry about that. Our bad. It's our bad. But you also have an extraordinary opportunity. It's a much richer world in all ways than it has ever been. There are more opportunities, intellectual, academic, uh, economic than there ever been before. There's greater resources devoted to each of the problems that we have to solve. And there are more opportunities. And what we need to, to connect resources and opportunities are ideas. And the source of ideas, I believe, is not just a person's brain sitting alone in a dark room somewhere staring at a computer screen. It is Communication. It's all of our brains working together. And that's why we're here today. To talk, to propose, to argue perhaps, and to communicate. Create more and greater ideas together than we could ever come up with alone. So uh, let me start my presentation. Now today's talk title is Small Sensor Big Changes. And first of all, I'd like to say uh, congratulations Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> So, but unfortunately, I'm living in Nagoya, so I do not know much about Tokyo. But this man must have thought like this, Tokyo is great. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be true for me. But I just wonder, like, is everything all right? Hmm, I don't think so, not really. So I, ha I think I, we have some concerns for Olympic Games. Maybe one of the examples is disease outbreak like Ebola last year, or maybe another example is air pollution, like the PM2.5. So I think these, you know, the material must be sensed, I mean detected for Olympic Games. But sometimes it, it's quite difficult to sense these material because it's quite small, or maybe they exist in quite small amount. But now scientist is making effort to, how to say, challenge this problem with small sensor, it looks like this. And this small sensor has various advantages like this, but today I do not 
I do not want to focus on difficult things, so let's skip it. And anyway, <laughs> it can, it's, oh sorry, it's able to detect the air pollutant or pathogens, diseases or something else. So for example, you can diagnose over 50 kinds of diseases such as cancer, or the HIV, influenza, diabetes, etc. in only from one milliliter of blood. And it costs only 10 American dollars and to finish in hours. It's quite cheap and fast. It's amazing, isn't it? So the next question is how this amazing uh, small sensor can be operated. So because it's small and able to detect many targets, so it can be integrated into various fields. Maybe it's integrated in portable devices such as wearable device or smartphone, or maybe in air conditioning systems. And these things are, will be equipped in schools or maybe transport system or city center, hospital, or air, airport, everywhere. And I think the potential of the small sensor will be expanded, oh sorry, significantly by combining with other technologies, so especially information technology, IT things. So I think this small sensor will bring a big changes into this world. And the example of the application is not only these three things. So please think about, sorry, please think your own idea. How can small sensor contribute to our life? And please tell me how, okay, your idea. Thank you for everything. Of how can sensors change our life? This is a really interesting question and not something which I was prepared for when I took this job as MC. <laughs> how do you think sensors can change our life? He mentioned air conditioners, uh, quarantine. So I suppose when people go through uh, the airport or uh, you know, across borders, you can quarantine them, uh, fix, figure out what uh, diseases they might be carrying and quarantine them faster and easier and cheaper. Any other ideas for how sensors might change our lives? I think sensors uh, will improve our lives in a way to um, adjust to personal things. What I mean, yes, what I mean personal is that um, I, I come from researching lights and colors. Mm -hmm. um, and often, uh, when I do when I do experiment, often I have a problem. Um, some people don't see colors um, as other people do. This is a problem when um, uh, when you have to make sure. Uh, the, uh, some people are color color blind, right? You want to keep going? Okay. Um, so I think sensors can personalize um, sense if, uh, for example, if that person can see your presentation, daily life, maybe. Um, we adjust lights and colors so that people, everyone can see. You're suggesting that yeah. an individual's environment will adjust to that individual and that sensors will inform that process. Now, you know, when you go home, you can use your smartphone or whatever to program your favorite lighting or colors or uh, temperature, whatever. But in the future, perhaps a sensor will detect what things you are most comfortable, including lights for crossing, uh, street crossings and whatever and automatically adjust to you and perhaps come up with the optimal uh, situation so that you know save energy or whatever. You know a lot of TVs recently adjust themselves when it's too bright in the room it'll turn down the TV. Have you seen that? That's, that's one of the sensors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And next I think they need a, a sensor on there to know when you've fallen asleep in front of the TV. Because I don't know about you, but my wife falls asleep in front of the TV all the time. I come home like 12 o'clock and she's been sleeping there obviously for like three hours and the TV's on. And then you turn it off and she wakes up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's move on. Uh, we've talked about IT, transportation, uh, lifestyle, global warming. Um, what else? Disease outbreak, air pollution. Everything, all sorts of problems that our, our world is facing. Let's open up the floor to a general discussion. We only have a few more minutes, but if there are any ideas which we sh you think we should get out there and discuss before we close out our uh, symposium, let us know. And also, that means you too, Kyushu, Tohoku, and Nagoya. I'm definitely going to ask each of, you, you, uh, each of your classrooms there for a comment at the end, at least. So someone think of something to say, please. <laughs> There's a lot of complacency with, with com which comes with comfortability. For example, it's uh, about 4.30 in the afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside. 
but we're all sitting inside with lights and air conditioning. And we're not just yelling at Tohoku, we're actually connected by the internet. We're using a lot of electricity to make this very important symposium happen. But it's hard to give up on the things which make us comfortable. But I think uh, Eikosan has brought up a really good point. And a lot of you come from countries uh, that aren't quite as energy heavy, uh, aren't as dependent on energy as Japan. Can any of you give us ideas for Japan and America for that matter, and probably for Germany and Switzerland and uh, Finland as well, for ways that we might be able to change our lifestyles just a little to make sustainability easier. Uh, having two or three obons is a great idea. Cuts down the traffic jams. No, I was just going to point out that because China has the advantage of having a one-party system, so then you can kind of use that to leverage into more cleaner technologies that has been happening because you had all the smoke problem. Okay. So the China, China has the advantage of using the one-party system to push into a more cleaner system. I know our friend from Florida probably uh, agrees with me that the American <laughs> uh, system is not particularly efficient. Democracy is very slow in making changes. But the top-down system in China can affect change much faster. Let's get our friends from Kyushu University in on the conversation. What do you think about China's approach to uh, <coughs> environmental problems and technological change? Yes, I think uh, one party can control the whole direction of this uh, uh, policy and uh, uh, with, uh, with the efforts of the uh, common people or the ordinary people, we will make a great contribution mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, to to solve these problems. A lot of people in the West are very mm, what's the word antagonistic toward global treaties to reduce emissions because they feel that China is not doing its part. How would you respond? That's a difficult uh, question, I know. Now China is a developing uh, country and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the population is so huge that uh, the country have to uh, make some change and uh, do their, uh, do its best to, uh, to, to, to have the ability to contain this, uh, contain this uh, population. And uh, uh, China have to to change something and uh, and uh, make uh, make itself prove uh, develop. I agree. Well, uh, hopefully we can all work together, since we all share the same planet. All its water and its air goes around eventually. And uh, I've I've also found I've often found the American resistance to treaties like that to be very counterproductive. I hope it works out better in the future. Now I'd like to respond to the last comments. Uh, obviously, I agree, we don't know everything. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We only get to live this life one time. We only get to inhabit this planet one time. And you're right, it's possible that there might be an ice age coming. And it's possible that we don't know everything we need to know about fuel cells. And it's possible that, you, that uh, Tokyo doesn't have a car problem. But I think the other options are also possibilities. That the world is getting hotter, more polluted, more crowded. We're running out of water and energy and uh, resources. And we have a population problem and a food problem and a government problem, and a safety problem, and all sorts of problems. And some of them might not be as bad as we think. Some of them might be more. The question is, are we willing to experiment with our only planet, with our only life? We only get one, one shot at it. Are we willing to risk it all on the possibility that we're wrong about our 
over-pessimistic view of the world. Maybe we should take a slightly pessimistic view and bet on the wrong side of things just in case we are right. That is, take a little bit of caution and maybe make some adjustments to how we live and how we think and how we interact just in case we are right. We, not, my, we, we being the people who believe in global warming and uh, all the other alarmist things I've, we've been talking about, just in case we're right, just on the 1% chance that we're right and that we are going to destroy our planet, maybe we should adjust our lifestyles and the way we think about it. We don't know everything, and obviously in our one hour and 45 minutes here together in this little forum, we weren't going to come up with a solution today. We weren't going to find it. But we did, I think, stumble upon the first step, and that's communication across countries, across cultures, across sexes, across generations. A lot of communication, exchanging of ideas, and production of new ideas. That's all it takes, I think, to get us started down the road to solving all the pro problems that we, as a country, as a community, as a world, face. So thank you all for all your participation, all your ideas, and all of your efforts from now into the future. Good job.